नमस्कार वैदिक सभ्यता धर्म दर्शन संस्कृति र सभ्यता विषय चिंतन करने क्रम में आज हमी जीवन पद्धति रान विषय चिंतन करते आज को हम चिंतन में चर्चा करना ब्रह्मचारी राम प्रसाद आमस्ते दाई नमस्ते श्याम आई वेलकम यू इन आवर सो ओके वेल थैंक यू वेरी मच इट्स अ प्लेजर टू बी हियर इन नेपाल स्पीकिंग विद यू अगेन आफ्टर सम टाइम सो दाई हाउ वुड यू डिफाइन अ वैदिक लाइफ वेल दस दस अ शोर्ट क्वेश्चन विच कुड हेव अ वेरी लॉन्ग एंसर श्याम द थिंग विद The concept of Veda is a very deep and multi-level uh, consideration, because Veda refers to knowledge, and knowledge has its application in every area of life, from the most superficial things uh, uh, we engage in during our day to the most profound things that we experience uh, in our lifetime. <coughs> Excuse me. So when you ask about a Vedic life, <coughs> normally it comes up in the context of traditional culture of India, Nepal, um, Sanskritic cultures, uh, because the Vedas are the um, the shastras, the old books that uh, give the knowledge on proper living and the ultimate goals and desires of a human being and what they can achieve in life. But a Vedic lifestyle is an integrated lifestyle. Uh, it may or may not involve. <coughs> participation in cultural things, uh, traditions that you have in Nepal, but those are Vedic traditions also. Um, more importantly, a Vedic life is an internal life of integration, and that comes about through the practice of meditation, uh, living a life which is harmonious with the nature and with the society and with our fellow human beings. All of this cultivates the ability to live in wholeness and ultimately Knowledge is about living in wholeness, and Veda and Vedic lifestyle is for that purpose, if I can say that. Okay, <laughs> but before that, it would be very nice for us to know your background and then your legacy that you have been totally mm. in this life for so many years. Well, my background is I, I'm an American, and I was uh, in my high school years when I was 18. I decided I wanted to learn meditation. And at that time, I had uh, the facilities to learn transcendental meditation in the United States while I was still in school. And I was uh, very motivated. I wanted to have the benefits of meditation, and I wanted to live a very positive life. So I learned uh, as a teenager. And then when I was 19 years old, I went off to a teacher training course so that I could become qualified to teach transcendental meditation to people in the society as well. <coughs> So that was back in 1974. So you can think I've had a 50-year history of practicing meditation, teaching meditation, and allied, allied subjects that go along with it. And uh, transcendental meditation is not, uh, quote unquote, a religious practice, but it is a spiritual practice. And the reason we say that is because a person does not have to commit to any particular religious path in order to practice meditation. And it can be practiced by every range of people, people who have no particular religious or cultural background per se, but just want to have a better, happier, more harmonious life. But obviously, the deeper aspects of meditation open us uh, up our spiritual nature. And that will normally express itself in the culture in which we have grown up or in which we live. So in the case of Nepal, you know, we find that when people uh, practicing transcendental meditation, and we also call Bhavati Dhyan. I currently live in India, and in India we refer to transcendental meditation as Bhavati Dhyan. Uh, what we find is that with regular practice, then uh, people take a deep, tend to take a deeper interest in their own traditional cultures. Uh, they tend to have a better appreciation, a deeper appreciation of it. And we find that without, <coughs> excuse me, I have a little horse. We find that without um, instructing people to change their lifestyles or to adopt any particular belief system, that people's orientation in life becomes more positive and we, they start to live those values very naturally without them being imposed on, them, on themselves from outside. So <clears throat> really the, 
practice of meditation is to develop, you could say, inner directedness towards uh, uh, higher values, better values, and to have a more happy and productive life. So everybody has their lifestyle, everybody has their culture, everybody has their personal temperament. So all of this can unfold itself by contacting and experiencing deeper layers of ourselves during the practice of meditation. And it's the key fundamental element that, that is common to all human beings is just that very desire, which we, we, we could say is the desire to be happy. Every human being desires to be happy. And then what does happiness mean? Well, it can mean many different things. But ultimately, the ability to be happy is the question. Because whether I have the food I want, or the cloth I want, or the car, or the profession, or whatever, the person who is doing all those things, or having all those things, are they happy or not? Are they enjoying them? Are they getting the value out of it because of their own nature? If we're under stress, and we're making poor decisions, and we're having difficulty managing, then obviously happiness becomes a concept instead of a living reality. And practicing meditation regularly uh, has a practical benefit of removing stress, as well as opening our mind to deeper levels of internal happiness, which then expresses itself in how we live our life. And again, there are many lifestyles, there are many aspirations in life, and in teaching Transcendental Meditation, Baba Tidian, we don't dictate to people what their lifestyle should be or what their aspirations in life should be. That's an individual and personal matter. But the ability to do well and to be happy and have an integrated life, that's the purpose for which people practice meditation, Sean. Okay, Dai. Uh, thank you <coughs> for the you know, deepest <laughs> expression. Mm -hmm. So, because in Vaidik Shastras, uh, it describes the glory of Brahmachari. Mm -hmm. As a Brahmachari yogi, uh, from among 400 uh, such Brahmachari yogis, mm -hmm. How do you feel to be connected to this uh, cultural, uh, you know, well, status? Uh, you know, everyone in life, I think, follows their own heart. And what you desire in life reflects uh, the nature of your personality, your temperament, maybe your cultural background and your aspirations, also your, your abilities in life. And I found in my life, since I was a teenager, even before I, I learned meditation, I desired to, uh, I desired the higher values that people commonly refer to as enlightenment, as in this in this culture as moksha and so on. Um, and for that, I knew even as a boy, I knew the practice of meditation, some spiritual endeavor was needed to to rise out of the ordinary condition of life and to uh, make progress spiritually. But now, I, again, I was a teenager. I didn't have uh, a deep understanding at the time. And it was just a, the impulse of my own heart that gave me this direction. So when you ask about brahmachari and what it means, uh, brahmachari is really following your passion for spiritual life. And if that is very strong, then that becomes the predominant pursuit of your life. And for that, for that purpose, uh, uh, brahmachari, it can be a practice, which means you're committed to a celibate, uh, not necessarily monastic, but a celibate lifestyle, <clears throat> so that you have the ability for uninterrupted focus on your internal spiritual life. Brahmachari also means <clears throat> that as you progress spiritually, those things which are not conducive to positive values or those things which are limiting to the mind and to the heart drop off naturally and one finds oneself living what to the outside may look like a very disciplined life but internally is actually a very free life mm -hmm. where a person is feeling a, a contentment that gives them the ability to pursue their, their, um, their aspirations spiritually or, or according to Dharma or whatever without obstacle and with less interference of the responsibilities of, uh, well, here you would say grihasti, household life, or professional career, and so on. So it's not for everybody, but for those people who have a passion for the subject, then that becomes, I would say, the life automatically. Mm -hmm. And it can be cultivated, uh, particularly, you know, when you're talking about uh, Vedic society, or in the modern times we call the Hindu Dharma, the uh, people will pursue this as a 
as a lifestyle with intention, maybe from very early on in their life. Uh, you know, people go to gurukuls to study Vedas, to, to study Sanskrit, and to develop spiritual discipline. But it's, it's both things. It can be, uh, according to a cultural context, it can also be just the inner unfoldment of your personality uh, if you have a passion for the subject of spirituality. And so I would, would look at it from those two points of view. Okay. And uh, uh, so what is meditation? Well, again, that's a simple word. Everybody's heard the word meditation. And everybody has seen statues of the Buddha meditating. And we've heard the stories of the great rishis who meditated in vast and lonely places and all these things. And although the, the word meditation is very commonly spoken, uh, there is a lot of different ideas what meditation might actually be, how it might be practiced, and what the goal of meditation is, and uh, what kind of benefits a person could expect to have from practicing meditation. And there are many different kinds of meditation. So I'm not expert in every type of meditation. I have a particular background with transcendental meditation and Bhavati Dhyan, and also advanced techniques of meditation related to that and other kinds of practices. But in general, to, for a general audience who might have interest, the practice of meditation is to take the mind or allow the mind to go in, inward from the superficial level of thinking and perceptual experience to quieter and quieter levels until ultimately one experiences the finest level within themselves, which is characterized by restful alertness, where the mind is unoccupied by either thought or sensation, is just reposing within itself. And there are different names for this, you know, uh, the Buddhist culture, the Hindu culture, different spiritual cultures refer to it. We can refer to it as, as samadhi, and there are different levels of samadhi and different kinds of samadhi. And they proceed um, and develop progressively over time. But if meditation is practiced correctly, benefits of meditation should come soon, and I would say sooner than later. And the, the, one of the key elements for practicing meditation correctly, and I'm relating this from my own personal experience of life, from the experience of, of having taught many people transcendental meditation, but also from uh, friendship and relations I've had with people practicing different kinds of meditation. Mm -hmm. The way the mind works is according to laws of nature, just like anything else. Yes. And the laws of nature of how the mind works um, is, uh, enable us to practice meditation successfully. And the main, I would say the main important feature of any practice of meditation is effortlessness. Mm -hmm. And you say effortlessness, what does it mean actually? Okay, it's very simple. We do not make effort. Mm -hmm. We do our practice, and in the case of Transcendental Meditation, it's a meditation involving use of mantra. But doing it effortlessly allows the mind to settle within itself. To make effort is to individuate the mind and keep the mind hung up on a particular level of thought, reasoning, understanding, and so on, which has its own value and its own purpose. But it does not allow the mind to settle down within itself and experience the deepest and finest levels. So for that simple element of effortlessness, when that is applied to other systems of meditation as well as a, a basic part of transcendental meditation, we find that the meditations are more successful and produce result more quickly. And this is something, you know, that has to do with the very nature of the mind. And so I don't want to go on and give a whole long talk about the practice of meditation. But certain very basic principles, uh, just like principles of physics or any of the other sciences, uh, allow the mind to settle down within itself. And understanding those principles, experiencing that, is what enables a person to progress uh, in a nice way and relatively quickly through their spiritual practices, uh, transcendental meditation being the practice that I've been involved in for a long time. But actually, for all, all systems have this common element. And I'm emphasizing that because it's sometimes a missing element uh, in different systems without realizing that just that one little thing can bring greater success to 
you know, different types of practices. And there are many kinds of practices, so I'm leaving it very general just because we could spend uh, yes, hours I, and hours describing. Yes, no, we can, we can talk about those, you know, benefits mm -hmm. later in sure. other programs. But the main thing we are uh, expecting here is that uh, because it is said that uh, everything is decided by our karma. Sure. So how <coughs> does, you know, because uh, you have been practicing transcendental meditation mm -hmm. or bhavati dhyan for the last 50 years, mm -hmm. which is in itself, it's a great thing. And because of that experience, you can express your personal experience to our, you know, viewers. So <coughs> basically, how does uh, um, regular meditation help? shape our mind so that we can leap towards dharma because it's a great discussion nowadays that mm. every every everyone wants to become dharmic but they don't want to follow any rules and regulations of right? course yeah of but course. at least <laughs> because you have been meditating for the last 50 years and so at least each and every person can meditate regularly and by your experience i think that's it's uh, directing towards the dharma mm. well okay what is what is dharma actually okay Dharma is, you know, normally defined in a spiritual or religious context. As a matter of fact, for many people, the word Dharma means religion. Okay? Yeah, yeah. So, so for many people, they say, I, I follow Buddha Dharma or Hindu Dharma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's been a great illusion so far. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Sanatana Dharma, the eternal Dharma. Hmm. Okay, but what is Dharma actually? Well, Dharma refers to living a life uh, naturally in tune with the laws of nature yes. that promote the development and the unfoldment of the higher values of life. And for that purpose, religion is followed. For mm. that purpose, spiritual discipline is followed. For that purpose, rules and regulations have been given. Now, I come from a culture where rules and regulations are something that the society doesn't like to have imposed from the outside. Mm. And the truth is, nobody really likes to have it imposed from the outside even cultural values and so on, if a person doesn't see the purpose of it or the value of it, then it becomes a burden instead of something that is elevating and liberating for them. Mm. All right. So I'm saying that for a purpose. Because in order to live a dharmic life, one has to touch to the field where, from which dharma arises. Right. And what is that field actually? Mm. Well, that is, the that is the field of consciousness. And we can say pure consciousness. We can say the level of, of atma, the, the level of nirvana, the level of, of samadhi. Yeah. Because from this fine level, uh, both internally as a human being, but also externally in nature, all the laws of nature function and begin to function from that very, very fine level. If you are experiencing that in your conscious life, then your life will start to automatically come in tune with those laws of nature that structure the living process itself. Okay. And this is the deeper level of Dharma. And so one finds that without imposing uh, in an artificial way rules or regulations that may be difficult to follow or seem unnatural to a person, that their life starts to become less complicated. They make fewer mistakes. They have more intelligent decisions. And those things which are not helpful or conducive to a healthy and happy life start to naturally fade away and more positive values start to come up. And so in my case, as an American with no understanding of traditional culture originally, then what I found is that the values that became expressed in my life and were expressing more and more in my life were more and more in tune with the traditional quote unquote dharma that you find in the traditional culture of India and Nepal and, and often in Southeast Asia. And so I developed a very strong interest in the cultural dharma also, because it reflected the values I was experiencing internally. Yes. So I, had, I gravitated towards that, and that's one reason why you'll see me often normally wearing traditional cloth, and why I like to live in Nepal, why I like to live in India. And the India and Nepal that I live in is not necessarily the India and Nepal that most Indians and Nepalis are living in, right. because I've had the good fortune to uh, be able to associate naturally with people who are very dharmic by nature and by culture. And that has also enriched and benefited me very much in my life. So I'm very grateful for that opportunity. But that opportunity would not be there if those values were not growing from, the, from within due to the practice that I had been yeah, engaged we'll in. Come, yeah, we'll come later yeah. about your you know, stay in Nepal for more than 15 years and then your, 
you know, continuous oh, so. continuous association with all these, you know, yeah. cultural backgrounds. Sure. But uh, here, uh, I want to know more on uh, how a meditation can shape, you know, a person's mind towards dharma. Okay, well, it's not that it meditation shapes the mind towards dharma. That's a little bit of a misunderstanding. What meditation does, it removes the obstacles, the stress and the, the misapprehension, the misunderstanding of, of living life, so that automatically the life begins to be lived in tune with dharma. And dharma, again, means the laws of nature mm. that structure the progress of life. And they will look different in different cultures and in different climates. Trust me, if you're living in the northern part of Canada where it's frozen you know, for six, eight months out of, the, out of the year, or you're living in Rajasthan, there are very different laws of nature with which you have to manage your life. But the ability to spontaneously live your life in tune with the natural law, with, in tune with the cultural uh, uh, laws of nature that are expressed through traditional culture, the original traditional culture, comes about by removing the stress, removing the obstacles within yourself that allow that, that kind of living to take place spontaneously and naturally. Because the importance here is actually, it's a, it's a deep question, but it's very important to realize that if a person, even with the best of intention, is living their life artificially by following rules or regulations or cultural norms, that don't actually match to their personality or their level of life, then they create stress. And the result of that is usually life becomes more complicated, mm. not more simple. Mm. So uh, the practice of meditation specifically, but also many spiritual practices will have the same, same effect, is that it removes the stress, removes the impediments, so the natural flow of life can take place. I want to this is not exactly your question, Sean, but something comes to my mind. Uh, a, a question had come, somebody had asked me some years ago about, uh, you know, uh, many of the traditional things that are prescribed in, in, in uh, Nepali traditional culture, particularly Nepali Hindu traditional culture. And they were kind of complaining that, you know, well, people don't follow this anymore. In the modern time, people are living, you know, we could say um, American lifestyle in an Asian context mm -hmm. or whatever they want to look at it. And they, they feel that, you know, these old um, uh, concepts of, of Dharma or cultural patterns are no longer applicable in this modern age, you know. And so they asked me what I thought about it. And I thought, well, okay, the model of society is changing all the time and has always been changing. Yes. Okay, now it's been, it has sped up quite dramatically in the last 50, 60 years from we see so much technological change and people's attitudes and behavior has changed tremendously over time. However, the, what was prescribed for the traditional way of living life for the purpose of spirit, having a spiritual life, which is our, really our main topic, um, those rules and regulations served a purpose. And in a simple way to understand it, the purpose they served was to prevent people from making mistakes that harmed their life and made their life more stressful, uh, less harmonious, and, and caused uh, them to uh, have more suffering in their life. So those rules and regulations were appropriate and are very appropriate uh, in the original context. But when you, when you look at how much life has changed, I mean, just practically how it's changed, then it's very difficult for most people to follow those rules and regulations, which were also part of a traditional, more agrarian, uh, less hectic, less pressurized way of living life. So what I have seen in my life is that the people, the traditional people who have followed the Vedic Dharma as, as an example, it could also be Buddha Dharma or whatever, um, who have followed it naturally their whole life long, mm. have a kind of wonderful sense of purity and innocence and simplicity about them that has really given them an opportunity to have a very high quality of life, a very ideal. Okay, but I, I preface that with who are able to naturally follow this, mm -hmm. you see? Because if you're struggling against the stream of life, it's going in a different direction, and you're struggling with it, it's, it can become counterproductive. The purpose of these things was to keep the life pure, if we can use that word without it being misunderstood. 
a, a, a pure life means a life that is not mixed up with all kinds of uh, things that might be harmful in different ways. When a person is practicing meditation, <coughs> what happens is as the mind goes to deeper levels, then the, bo the physical body actually begins to refine itself and it throws off, gets deep rest, it throws off all kinds of stress and abnormalities that are accumulated from the process of living. And what we find is that serves the purpose in a modern context of what the rules and regulations of the past served in a cultural context. Right. And so these things are complementary to each other, and I don't uh, say one would replace the other and so on. But it, as I can say in my own life, with no original understanding of Dharma, I found myself naturally uh, following uh, or expressing a lifestyle that was very complementary to the traditional Dharma of, say, Nepali culture, particularly the spiritual culture. And consequently, um, I've received a very great and very um, genuine welcome into many aspects of Nepali society that you don't normally or necessarily would associate with someone who was born outside of this particular cultural context. Uh, when did you come to Nepal for the first time and what attracted you that <coughs> you lived here continuously for f more than 15 years? Well, uh, first time I came to Nepal was in the mid-1990s. Uh, and I came on pilgrimage, actually. Okay. I had read about uh, some of the holy places of Nepal in India, and I had an opportunity to travel. And I came to uh, Nepal, and I really I knew nothing about Nepal except little bits and pieces that I had read, but I felt a strong attraction to Himalaya and all that. So when I, within a, a day or two through, we can say, circumstance, um, I had met... Uh, uh, Nepali Brahmanas uh, from the Pashupatinath community. And uh, normally, um, this part of the traditional culture isn't much interested in interacting with Westerners. They have, a, have their own cultural stream, and you know, there's not much of a natural connection there. But for whatever reason, um, there seemed to be a very uh, warm and genuine welcome for me to participate in many things. and. Uh, uh, I enjoyed it tremendously, I have to say, and I found it very enriching and uh, filling in also certain gaps in my own uh, life experience. So Nepal was very attractive to me, and I um, felt like I got tremendous benefit from association with Nepalese and traditional cultural things, and the landscape, of course, you know, Himalaya Mountains is this, its own thing, it's a vast discu discussion just there. So, uh, so I left, you know, as I was only here six weeks or something. And then I thought, well, that was a good life experience. And circumstances were such, I found myself back again, and then back again. And then after some time, I've, I found myself living here. And I had opportunity to work for uh, the Nepal Marshi Vedic Foundation, uh, doing various kinds of Dharma work, uh, promoting meditation and Vedic Yagya and giving support to gurukuls for the traditional training of Nepali Brahmin boys to become pundits and to get their Sanskritic education. So all these things gave me opportunities to stay more and uh, to go deeper into all the things that Nepal has to offer, which is, by the way, quite tremendous. But the ability to take advantage of that was really more because of the spiritual practices that I had the opportunity to follow, which um, uh, kind of created a natural... Um, connection to people, place, and circumstance. Okay, Dai. Uh, different people have different understanding about Nepal. Mm -hmm. So, in your view, what is Nepal? Well, I can say um, Nepal has been almost, for me, almost like a love affair. Mm -hmm. Okay? And the reason I'm saying that is because um, I found Nepal to be endlessly fascinating and endlessly new. You know, uh, you know, when you look at the map of Nepal in comparison to India, China, you know, the neighbors and all this, uh, geographical neighbors, uh, Nepal seems very small. Mm. And perhaps, what is it, it's some mountains or something. But uh, Nepal contains within, it, within its ge or geographical, political, um, you know, uh, uh, boundaries, um, it contains so many wonderful elements of a spiritual landscape that reflect everything that you develop through living a spiritually oriented life. 
Right. And so what you find is like at almost every twist and turn of the road, if you're traveling across the country and within the Kathmandu Valley here and there, tucked away in the old parts of the cities, are all these wonderful things of the traditional spiritual culture or that gave rise to the traditional spiritual culture. They're still there, very vibrant and very accessible, uh, very natural. And the sheer density of it, there is so much in such a small geographical location that for a person like myself, I would say it's endlessly fascinating. It's like a love affair where you can't stop thinking about the person or whatever it might be. And in the same way, uh, several times in my life, I said, well, I've been in Nepal for some time. I think I've, you know, you know, had a great experience and now it's time to go. And then I find myself back in Nepal again, as I'm here today, actually. Um, so the value of living in Nepal as opposed to other countries in the world, and this will uh, maybe surprise people living in other countries in the world, is that when I first came to Nepal, I was talking to a Nepali Brahmin friend of mine, and he was telling me how in the old books that the, uh, they had the concept of tapo bumi, um, karma bumi, and bog bumi. And I thought, well, what do you mean by that? He said, well, you know, he said, the, uh, the earth is composed of different qualities in different places, and that influences how people live their lives and what they aspire for in life. And um, tapo bumi is the place where your tapasya, your spiritual endeavors, not only do you practice, but they bear fruit. Mm -hmm. in this, because you can practice any spiritual practice anywhere in the world, basically, as long as, as you uh, wish to make the effort, it's, it's always possible. However, the nature of the Himalaya country, particularly parts of India, northern India, particularly Nepal, um, Tibet, and this, this part of the, the geography, uh, is tapo bumi. And it's a place where your spiritual endeavors bear fruit. Mm. And of course, we're doing things in our life because we like them to bear fruit. So that's a big attraction, I have to say. And then India, Southeast Asia, and these kind of countries um, are karma bumi, where people go to resolve their different karmas in life and to grow and learn and have different kinds of experiences. And then bog bumi, this is the wealthy countries, uh, maybe like the Western countries and this thing, where the purpose of life or the trend of life is to just to enjoy, to enjoy the senses, to uh, for sense gratification only is really how it is. So if a person has interest in spiritual development, find that living in Nepal, visiting Nepal, uh, interacting with people who have grown up in the traditional culture here is endlessly fascinating because it's endlessly enriching your own personal life, your so, own personal experience. So do you want to say people who are spiritually motivated are more attracted here or? Well, what, what, is, what is the traditional understanding of Himalaya? Hmm. Himalaya is a place where you go to find enlightenment. Everybody has this concept. Hmm. I'm talking to a friend in Thailand many years ago and uh, she was telling me, like, oh, I remember my uncles. You know, she was an older lady. She said, I remember my uncles, her uncles. Uh, they were talking about Kailash, and they were talking about Himalaya and how that is where the real spirituality takes place. So people have had this draw, a natural draw to the Himalayas, and they look to the north, to the Himalayas, as a place of refuge for the soul, where you'll find solace, where your, where your spiritual practices will produce maximum benefit. And that has been in the culture for as long as there's been any culture, actually. Mm -hmm. And that understanding, because that experience is there. Uh, first time I went to Muktinat, which was many years ago now. And uh, I remember I, I was sitting there, and I had the experience of samadhi without any spiritual practice. Because the nature of the, of the land itself was so awake on that level, and then because I had, obviously I had been doing spiritual practices for much of my life, but that just came very naturally, automatically, by virtue of the place itself. So yes, Nepal is very special, and you can say it's because Nepal is basically Himalayas. I mean, the Terai region is the entrance to Himalayas, so it's all interconnected. So, so. That, that means in your view, Nepal is basically a Tirtha? with a lot of uh, powerful spiritual spots. Well, that's definitely true. That can help uh, people's evolution. Oh, absolutely true. And 
you know, uh, much of it is uh, described in the traditional literature. Um, a lot of places are sort of local, known by the people in the local community, and maybe not so much for people at a distance. And uh, my personal experience is that everywhere I go in Nepal, I find something of this nature, which is very, you know, uh, interesting and very beneficial for me spiritually, just to experience just by association. Uh, but like all good things, you know, um, you have to have uh, an interest in them. Mm. You can look, you know, uh, there's a, that old story, you know, uh, somebody finds a, a large diamond, you know, it's worth, you know, uncalculable amount of money, but it thinks it's a piece of glass, so it throws it away. So somebody who knows the value of a diamond feels, oh, my good luck has arrived. And somebody else says, oh, it was an annoying piece of broken glass, and they, they throw it. To get the advantage of living in a country like Nepal, a person does need to have an awareness of the value that is there and feel a natural affinity for it. And in the modern time, you know, uh, what you see in society is that it's not as, as strong or natural to the people as it was before. And that has to do with the model of society changing. You know, the pace of life is, is more pressurized, the stress is more, people are more looking to the externals for happiness rather than having the experience of the internals, which are the basis of, of happiness. But in Nepal, there is so much, and it is still so rich, the foreigners who come to uh, visit Nepal, very commonly what they say is like, well, about 80% will say something like, well, if I ever get a chance, I'll come back to Nepal again. Mm. And why do they say that? Mm. Well, their main, uh, for many people, their main reasons coming is the mountains. They've heard the spectacular nature of Himalaya is so beautiful, and they want to go trekking or whatever it is like that. And what they find is that they fall in love with the, the people. Mm. The personality of the, of the people in the country of Nepal is such, there's a kind of attractiveness there. And that is because they're Nepali. They grew up in Nepal. Okay. And those laws of nature have helped to develop the, the, the personality and the culture. And people coming from outside appreciate it very deeply. I know I did. And, okay. and, so and particularly, it. where in Nepal uh, would you find enchanting experience? Because you have traveled a lot of places, mm. from mountains to Tarai. So well, I, I, it's a long list, you know, I would have to say, because obviously there are famous places, you know, uh, to go. Gosan Kunda is, of course, wonderful, and Muktinath, and uh, I'm aspiring to go one day to Damodar Kunda. I haven't been up that side, <laughs> but, but I have been in Upper Mustang and, and uh, the Mukti Kshetra area of Nepal, but also in the Tarai and these places. You know, normally what happens is that a place becomes known because its quality has had an impact on the people who have visited it, yes. and therefore mm. it becomes popular for a particular reason. Well, there are so many of these places in Nepal that I find it very difficult to make a finite list. But the principle is that they are easily accessible here. Yes. And I will give you one example, because it's not me. It's somebody else who was... Um, I had gone to Gosan Kunda, which of course is a very famous terta, it's a holy place, and and uh, it's very important in traditional Nepali culture. And so I had gone there with, with some friends for the purpose of pilgrimage. And on the way, uh, we uh, encountered a group of, of trekkers coming from Scotland. Okay. And these are people who were trekking for nature. Mm. They were not for a spiritual orientation, and they were like, um, you know, they were just looking for natural beauty and healthy exercise and, you know, the normal thing. So there were these two young ladies, uh, and uh, after, you know, we'd had different conversations, and, and they had gone up higher and come back down, and they approached me and they asked me, I said, you know, uh, Ram Prasad, uh, we know you know more about the traditional cultural things here, but, but what is this place? Mm. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, well what is it? Why? I said, well, okay, um, it's in a simple way, I would say this is, this is what people call a tirta, as you mentioned, is considered to be a holy place. And the reason it's a holy place is because people come here and they have certain kinds of experiences which helps them to cross over things within themselves. So they find a, a deeper sense of satisfaction, maybe spiritual experience. And very often, it's emotional for people. And you'll find that people have tears coming to their eyes and this kind mm. of thing. And they, these two girls say, oh, we really thank you for saying that because we've had tears coming to our eyes all day long and we don't know why. 
And I said, well, that's because it's the nature of the place. The vibration of the place is conducive to the natural flow of the heart. And that is something that can bring tears to a person's eyes, whether they know about it or not. This is not a psychological thing because you've been reading about it in a book. Mm -hmm. This is not because your grandmother told you you should go there, it will make you a better person. No, this is because the nature of the place has its natural influence. And so even though you don't know this, you're having that very experience. They said, well, it's really true, but we had no idea. We mm -hmm. just came because the guidebook said it was pretty. Mm -hmm. okay? So that's, that is your Nepal. So, so many places are like that, and they impact you very positively. Yeah. So uh, it means the awareness uh, plays a big role. I'm sorry? Do you agree that if a person is aware that uh, what Nepal has, uh, you know, to give mm -hmm. on? Well, both things. The thing is, see, if you, if you have some knowledge about the subject, then you're going to naturally be attracted to find out more and experience it personally. On the other hand, if you have no knowledge of the subject, but you experience it personally, then you're going to want to find out more about the subject. Yes, yes. So the two things are like, like you know, both sides of a coin. And uh, this is one reason uh, Nepal is, is very popular amongst many kinds of people, but particularly people with a spiritual orientation. Because here, their spiritual experiences, the work that they have done for themselves, bear fruit. That's what I was referring to previously. Mm. Tapobumi means actually the place where your spiritual practices bear fruit. Yes. And that is the satisfaction of life, and, and satisfaction of a life well-lived. Satisfaction of a dharmic life, mm. where the aspiration has been to, to develop, cultivate, and experience higher values. And that happens very naturally, and has the reinforcement from the environment itself. So yes, I can meditate in, in New York City. I can meditate in, in Alaska. I can go to the desert in Saudi Arabia. I can do all my spiritual practice anywhere, and I do. However, in Nepal, very naturally, the higher experiences tend to come for people who are sincerely pursuing you know, a, a, a spiritual life. So for that, it's a great resource. And I don't know of any country quite like that. I mean, there are so many wonderful things in Southeast Asia, India. Also, I live in India now, uh, that are very wonderful along this line, but not so densely compact and available as I have found in Nepal. That's one reason I find myself back in Nepal. Okay, apart from India. these natural, natural yeah. places that you just mentioned. Uh, so, is there anything to add on to the cultural development here? and uh, you know different arts and artifacts that also displays the some connection to the natural beauty well the natural law of a place reflects it in the culture it's reflected in the culture in the lives of the people now in the modern time there's so many influences coming from here and there that there's a lot of mix up thing but you know the traditional culture of nepal is a culture of the heart mm. and it's a heart-based society and I was studying the Pali language, and I'm not gifted with language. Uh, you know me well enough to know I'm definitely not gifted with, with, with languages. But in, when foreigners were studying the Pali, what we found is that we're laughing all the time. Mm. And we're laughing because there's a joy in the language itself. Mm. And where yes. does the language come from? Mm. Well, it comes from the culture. Yeah. Where does the culture come from? It comes from the laws of nature where the people are living. Mm. Okay? Mm. And so more than Hindi, more than other languages I have a little familiarity with, there's a, there's a kind of joy in the Pali language. And you walk along the street and you see Nepalis talking with each other and smiling on the face, laughing, and there's a kind of a joy in the heart. So a heart-based culture is inherently a culture that is very suitable for promoting a spiritual quality of life if a person has that awareness or that desire. And so that's, again, reflecting the laws of nature of the land. It's not just because, you know, we speak Nepali language or we wear Nepali dakatopi or whatever it might be. The laws of nature of the land itself are conducive for that quality of life to express in human life. Okay. And your traditional culture here is a deep and endlessly fascinating subject. You know, uh, I mean, how many people have made PhDs studying some small aspect of the traditional culture in Nepal, from the old architecture and 
the study of Vastu and the, the study of traditional music and the, uh, the, ri the rituals and the, and the ways of living a spiritual life and puja and yagya and worship of different deities and the philosophy behind that and the philosophy behind that and the ultimate philosophy f behind everything. And all of that is, is enabled and uh, becomes more easily accessible when you're in an environment where the laws of nature support that. Mm. And that you find to be characteristic of life in Nepal. Okay, talking on deities, because yeah. you are also collecting a lot of pictures of murtis, different murtis and all for the last many years. Yeah, so, so, so <laughs> Okay, you are fond of... Uh, all these things, yes. Uh, yeah, so yeah. please uh, tell us something about... Okay, so it's such a deep subject if you take it to, to that level. When I look, when I first came to Nepal, I would wander around the old Durbar squares by myself, mm. you know, and I'm looking at the old temples from the Newari culture, and oh, you know, who could make such things like this, you know, because there was so much in it, and I didn't have a lot of intellectual knowledge, but I found it endlessly fascinating just to look. And then I, I read on it, and I realized, well, there's a purpose behind each and everything. There's a meaning behind it. And the forms of the deities are expressions of how laws of nature function on the deepest levels of life. Mm. And becoming familiar with that in their, well, they have a form, but they also have a sound, and sound is mantra. Mm. And mantra is then gives rise to the ability to do, do uh, ceremonies, yagya, puja, and that awakens those qualities within the heart of the people who participate. And that's the same thing as what you look at cards on the temple wall. And there's all this, this deep knowledge that was there coming from the ancient times and was applied in different ways. But So you wander around and you see these things and you think, who could these people have been who understood and experienced so much to create things like this? Because it's not there anywhere mm. else in the world as far as I have experienced. Mm. And so that was, was quite fascinating. And what you find is that at a certain point in your life, you look at a, at a picture, or if you are there in person, you look at a, a sculpture or a statue of religious nature, and the experience of the person who had the inspiration to have it made comes through the, through the physical form, and you can touch to that experience also. And I, uh, I find that that's quite a, a phenomenal thing. It's difficult to express in words because this is now going into the realm of personal experiences, and I don't feel that necessarily, you know, to expound, you know, anything about, about my own things with that. But I have found it very enriching, and people love it on an artistic level. Mm. And then deeper than the artistic level is the cultural level from which the art came. And deeper than, than that is the ins actual spiritual inspiration that arose in somebody's heart that was the reason the thing was made or the art object was made in the first place. And that quality is all throughout the landscape of Nepal. Okay, and personally, mm -hmm. what devata you feel close with? Ah, this, that would be every devata. <laughs> <laughs> because... <laughs> because <laughs> you have visited, uh, you know, many Sivalingas, many Ganesh mm. temples, and then Narayan temples, Devi temples. If we so count, it's yeah. uncountable. But still, because we all are attracted to one form of Devata. So. Well, as, as a yogi, I have to say that, of, of course, I have uh, affinity for certain things more than others. But also, I would say... You know, I'm visiting now, and I've been, you know, as, as you're a Nepali Brahmin who uh, has a lot of experience with the cultural landscape in the Kathmandu Valley, I'm kind of prodding you, I'd like to go visit this place, that place, and this place. Uh, there are two things. There are, are those things which uh, are very deep in your own heart, mm -hmm. and they take expression in form, and so that form might be Narayan and different qualities of avatar and so on. But there's also time. Mm. At certain time, certain things will come forward because it's purposeful. Right. So, in the study of Jyotish, which is we, you know, all know is the traditional astrology in Nepal, you know, uh, you have a background in Jyotish. I have other friends also, and people will tell me, "Oh, in this time, um, it would be very useful for mm. you to go and visit a temple of Bhagavati or to go to 
maybe Muktinad and have darshan of Shaligram and this thing because it relates to certain laws of nature expressing through the planetary patterns in your life. Well, I would say every time, or it seems to be, every time somebody gives me this advice, it's already taking place spontaneously. I'm having desire to go there. I'm having mm. that experience. I'm, it's coming very naturally. And this is also a, a great compliment to Nepal because this is a very subtle thing for spiritual aspirants and for people who wish to live a spiritual life. The quality of your ancestors and the quality of life that they led, they encoded all of this in the buildings, in the structure, mm. and how things were done, where the holy places are. They recognized that quality is in this place, and a temple came up, or maybe reverence has come up for a natural formation of the landscape, or whatever it is. And so uh, different people, and myself also, uh, you know, will find an affinity for certain aspects of it. And so I don't like to say because, uh, you know, directly to the point of your question, because it's limiting to say a, a particular form. Okay, I understand. Because it does capture the heart. It's true. A particular mm. form does capture the heart. And, but even that form is constantly evolving and displaying mm. new and more and different. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a continuum. Mm. And, but then also there's the element of time. Like I say, at certain times, something will come up. You'll find, oh, I, have, I must go to Dhammadar Kunda. I must go to a Pashaparinath or whatever it might be. And then you'll find reflected in the laws of nature that structure the individual life, those qualities are coming lively or there's a mm. purpose for them. And that av availability of that in Nepal is on a much higher and developed level yes. than you'll find virtually anywhere in the world. And I don't say that because you're Nepal, I like to make mm. compliment, but just as a factual expression. Okay. And uh, because mantra are considered to be the natural expression. Yes. So, because you know a lot of mantras and stotras. So, for us, can you please uh, pronounce one sloka or half sloka or some mantras so that <laughs> we can, you know... Uh, so, so, you can see how poor my, my Sanskritic uh, uh, pronunciation might be. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to satisfy you for that. However, I'm going to, to give a, a, a point here. Where does mantra come from? Mm. Okay. Mm. Mantra is the primordial sounds of nature as expressed through human speech. Mm. Okay? okay? And the origin of this is within the very foundation of consciousness and the existence of the material world itself, at that point where they are the same thing. Mm. And those laws of nature, which are Vedic deities and we can say gods and goddesses or whatever, which are responsible for how life is lived and how life functions, and, and what are the natural laws of nature itself, wind, rain, mountains, whatever it may be. But more importantly, that allows the evolution from the human status, which is hardly better than an animal, to the divine status of an enlightened human being who truly knows the reality of life and lives it as a natural thing. Mantra are those finest vibrations that come from the very source of creation. And Cognize, we say cognize, or they arose in the mm. hearts and minds of the ancient rishis, mm. who were the people of such vast enlightenment that you can only guess what it may have been like for them, you know, in their time. But recorded from them are those sounds, those qualities of vibration, which are useful for developing and expressing all these things that lead to having a very wonderful life, a spiritual life. And yes, they, the mantra is a sound, but the sound has a form, and the form may look like this and may have this personality, and you can take it the other way around, that that personality comes out of a form and that form comes out of a sound, and ultimately it comes from infinity itself. So learning about mantra and, and practicing mantra in your spiritual practice or learning certain stotras that appeal to your heart because they represent um, uh, certain uh, devatas that, uh, that have a strong attraction for you, all of it helps for this to unfold in the human life. Mm. And that's a very important thing. And again, because it's part of the traditional culture in Nepal, the availability of it here is much more so than you have in many places. And you have different cultures because also the mantra expresses itself in different cultures in different mm. ways. Uh, you know, for instance, the Sanskritic mantras that are used uh, in Hindu culture are different than the ones used in Buddhist culture. Okay. But you'll find that they also have 
have effect. You know, uh, one of the things I learned very early on, because I'm not particularly good with language, was I learned the recitation of Hanuman Chalisa, okay. which is in, in, in the, the language of Awad, 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 yeah. Ayodhya, which is mm. called Awad, mm. which is a kind of Hindi, mm. because Hindi, again, is a, kind of a mix of different things. But it's not a formal language. Mm. But it produces this recitation of Hanuman Chalisa, Ramatrita Manasa, produces the same effect as Vedic mantra, yes. which has come from the minds of the rishis which are the very deepest laws of nature, which are in very perfect Sanskrit and very perfect pronunciation. Well, how can it be? Because this is a little bit of a, I won't say a rough language, but a, a less formal language, we could say. Mm -hmm. Well, because the, the Rishi, the, the, the great personality of Tulsidas, whose heart and mind were completely submerged, submerged yeah, yeah. in infinity itself, yes. the thoughts and the words that were expressed carried that out into the expression. So even though they are not formal Sanskrit, they have the value of Sanskritic mantra and are available for people who are not particularly well trained in the mm. pronunciation or have the background to, uh, to learn Sanskrit as, as an example. Um, if you're going to learn language and you're going to learn it very properly, you need to hear it from childhood. Yes. Because yes. a certain level of development uh, is missed if you, those particular sounds and those particular vibrations are not heard while the brain and the neurophysiology is developing. And then it's, it's more difficult to learn language. Everybody knows it's more difficult to learn language later in life rather than earlier in life. And particularly in childhood, you know, children pick it up automatic, you know, it's, it's just because they're just ripe for that. So I would say, because I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to show my either my proficiency. No, but or, because or you are you are <laughs> practicing <laughs> daily, yes. you do guru pujan daily. Oh yes. And then uh, so at least one bars of guru guru, uh, you guru know. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwara, Guru Sakshat Param Brahma, Tasmay Shri Guru Venma. Thank you very much. So yeah. of yeah. course, uh, Guru is a very important function in the life, to have the good fortune to come under the patronage of an enlightened person, a Siddha Mahatma, someone whose development is such that naturally in their association we are elevated and opportunities open in our own life to have those kind of experiences and to, uh, to benefit us individually and society as a whole. And for that good fortune, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, earlier in our talking, you, for a moment, you just mentioned the word karma. Mm -hmm. Well, no one can say why or why not those opportunities may come to a man. Mm -hmm. and we, so we simply say, well, the karma is there or it's not there or whatever we want to say. But good fortune is always at the heart of the matter. And good, the ultimate good fortune is our own uh, deepest level of consciousness, which is what the guru opens up to us and is actually the guru is not a human being well is a human being but the value of what the guru is is beyond the human quality of the and form that you see yeah. and that is something that is a great good fortune to have but you know um, whether that's been the experience of a person in their life or not the value of these great souls um, is embodied in traditional culture and is expressed in mantras that have been inherited through the passage of time. It is in those beautiful deities carved in, the, in and you know, we find in the old buildings and in temples and in people's private homes and these things. All of it is intertwined. And so I think we're probably running to sort of towards the end of our time here. But I strongly would encourage anybody who had the patience to listen to me meander around with these answers is that uh, the Life worth living mm. is a progressive life that opens up your soul, the atma, and that will give you the satisfaction of living in your life that will never fail you, no matter what your karma may be. In the mix of karma can be many things, obviously we know. But the value of life that unfolds uh, or can unfold in your lifetime is of such tremendous worth. And it's not... Uh, for a philosophical reason and it's not for because somebody told you you should do like this or like that it's for your own happiness and satisfaction of living 
And as you are happier and as you are more satisfied with your life, that influence, you will touch, everybody who touches to you will get some value of that as those who've had good fortune to have access to highly developed souls and they had, who served the purpose of guru for them or whatever had access to that. And that is available in life and it's part of the culture of Nepal. And so I feel very grateful that my Thanks. life, that I had the karma, that my life uh, brought me to Nepal, and I had association with so many fine people here. And I, all I can say is Jay Gurudev. And I'm okay. Very Thank you very much for sharing your yeah. experience. And this will definitely inspire us to move uh, in the direction of Dharma. Like uh, you have been, you know, doing all these activities selflessly for the Dharma and for your, you know, desire to. Sarv, sarv well, dharma. You know, there's, there's a Vedic, you like the, the word Vedic, there's a Vedic concept. You know, that which you desire for yourself, mm. you give it away. Mm. Okay? So you need money, you know, so make some donations, support other people who have more need than you have. Okay. You're hungry, then you should feed people and give nourishment, and nourishment will come to you. But the deepest level is love. Yes. Because the more love you give in life, and share with others the more love you have in your own life. Yes. And this is also part of the Vedic Dharma. Yeah? Uh, so that satisfaction, uh, by doing those things that bring satisfaction and happiness to others, directly increases your own satisfaction and happiness. So the most selfish thing you can do is to be nice to other people. <laughs> <laughs> and that will benefit you more than anything else. In That's a world. very good conclusion <laughs> of our talk today. In uh, dharmic life, we talk about we should eat this, we shouldn't eat this. Right. Okay, and what is your experience on different kinds of food we have? Yes. Uh, your, your dharmic concept about food is correct. That is my experience. Mm. Okay. Well, what happens is um, what you eat creates your physiology. And as your physiology and your brain chemistry is functioning... So the thoughts come to your mind, so the behavior is exhibited, and so uh, is your happiness and sadness and other things in life. When people eat what I would call rough food, yeah. and I'm not, I'm not advocating a particular diet because I'm, I'm not a health guru kind of person, <laughs> but people who eat rough food develop roughness in their personality. And people who eat sattvic food uh, develop sattvic, more pleasant and more pleasing nature in your personality. It is a biological, neurophysiological neuro-physio- um, reality of life. What you are, what you eat. Yes. Now, there was a, a very great Vaidya, uh, Brihaspati Dev Triguna was giving a lecture to some people who, uh, in the United States. And uh, he was, uh, you know, he was a traditional Vaidya, very highly respected in India in his time. And he was kind of disappointed in what he was feeling when he would take the Nadi Vigyan, the, the pulse of the people. And he found that there was a lot of roughness in their physiology. And he realized, ah, it's because, well, they're eating rough food. Okay. And I, you, can see, you can guess that that might include alcohol, it might include meat, it might include other things, whatever. And so he gave a lecture on vegetarianism. This is not my lecture. But this is, this is the, he made this point. He's, and this is an example, and so why a person can understand it. When an animal is going to be slaughtered for the purpose of food, mm. what happens? The animal has fear. The animal has anger. Yeah. It has pain. It has stress and, also. It has stress, you can say. That creates a biochemistry of those qualities in the animal's physiology. Right. When you eat that... That creates those quality or promotes those qualities in your physiology. Physiology so even multiplied, yeah. And it multiplies mm. that. Mm. This is not going into even the level of karma, mm. of of causing pain and suffering for for greed, for mm. the greed of taste, yeah. And this kind of thing. That is that is all there too. And for people who um, desire to live a spiritual life, then it's very conducive to fit, to spiritual life to eat sattvic pure and, and high quality food that it does not involve creating suffering, harm, or hurt to others. Right. And that includes the animal creation and so on specifically. 
Um, so that's my opinion about that. And I found that uh, although I don't preach vegetarianism, I'm a practicing vegetarian since I'm a teenager, and I, you know, I have no taste for other food. But I found when I was a new meditator, and I was not a vegetarian when I first became a, a meditator, I found that uh, my morning meditations had a certain quality of depth to them, and was very satisfying to me. Okay. And my afternoon meditation wasn't a quite of that same quality. Uh, and I realized that those days when I didn't eat any non-vegetarian food, I had a deeper experience of meditation in the afternoon because the quality, the difficulty or the work that it takes the physiology to break down hard protein, which means animal flesh, mm. just from a physiological point of view, creates an excitation in the body. It creates a kind of heat and, and this thing, which is going sort of the opposite direction of the refinement of the physiology that's developed through spiritual practice and specifically meditation. So for me, within a couple of months, I was like, well, I value my meditation more than I value my lunch. Mm. So I decided, no, I'll just you know, lean towards non-vegetarian food. And within three or four months, I found myself, I naturally had become pure vegetarian. But it was not because I understood an ethical thing. I was a purely a practical, yeah. uh, physiological mm. experience. Because you experienced it, yeah. 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 And what we find is that when people are living a dharmic life, a spiritual life, their life tends to automatically favor more and more sophic things, more and more yes, sophic food, definitely. sophic people, sophic environment, and these things which are conducive to their inner development. Mm. And that's a natural thing. And people who have no interest in that subject, uh, they're stressed and they're tired and they're, they're whatever they're having to deal with, then they go for for the harder and rougher food, and that interplay is there. And there's a lot more to it than that also, but yes. that's an easy enough way to understand it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome.